You know, the last words of someone take on special significance. Last words of a dying person take on extra special significance because normally a person won't waste any words if they know it is their last. Last words spoken by a trusted friend or a family member before they leave on a long trip are especially important because at those moments they tend to focus on communicating that which is most important to them. The last words spoken by our Lord on earth before he ascended into heaven are indeed incredibly special. Over the past few weeks, we've been looking at events during our Lord's final week on earth. As we conclude this study, we're going to jump ahead a little bit and look at his final interaction between the risen Lord and the disciples just before Jesus left earth, just before he ascended into heaven. And we discover as we look at his final words, a reminder of how it is that we are to live today. Turn with me, please, to Acts chapter 1, as we'll be starting in verse 6 this morning. Let me set the context for you. Jesus arose from the grave three days after his death upon the cross. And then for the next 40 days, he spent time appearing to his disciples, teaching them and preparing them for the future. As we pick it up in verse 6 of chapter 1 in the book of Acts, we are on his final day on earth. Actually, we're in the final few moments before our Lord left the earth and ascended into heaven. Clearly, Jesus knew he was about to leave. He knew that he was about to ascend to the Father, as he had told his disciples that he would do even on the day of his resurrection. He wanted his disciples to remember a few very important key principles as he left. He wanted them to be reminded of what they needed to stay focused on and what to be motivated by after he was no longer physically among them. And so in this section, we see three important applications of how to live our lives apart from the physical presence of Jesus, and they provide us with guidelines even this very day. As we begin, we see our first guideline, and that is, as his disciples, we are to live waiting for the king. We are to be those who wait for his return. Look at verse 6. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? Now that first word, so, takes us back to the previous verses. This question of the disciples about the restoration of the kingdom actually came directly out of what Jesus had been teaching them for these 40 days. Verse 3 tells us that Jesus had been teaching them in particular about the kingdom of God. And as a result, they had a question. Was now the time for the kingdom to be restored? Now, to fully appreciate this question, we must understand what the kingdom of God is and what it means to restore the kingdom to Israel. As we look at the concept of kingdom as it's used throughout the scripture, we see there are basically two different ways that this term is used. There is a spiritual kingdom of God and there is a physical kingdom of God. There is a spiritual kingdom describing how God is ruling through the hearts and minds of his people. And then there's a physical kingdom that God has promised to establish physically on earth where he will physically rule over all the nations. We see Jesus taught a lot about the kingdom throughout the Gospels. In fact, the word kingdom is used over 115 times throughout the Gospels. Sometimes Jesus refers to the kingdom of God. Sometimes he calls it the kingdom of heaven. Sometimes the kingdom. They all refer to the same concept. Now, Jesus uses the phrase both in the spiritual and in the physical meanings. And often he used it in a spiritual sense to refer to the rule of God in the hearts of men or we might say the sphere of salvation. To be in the kingdom of God in a spiritual sense is to be saved. To be outside the kingdom is to be lost and to be unsaved. And in the spiritual sense of the kingdom, to be invited into God's kingdom is to be invited to receive the gift of salvation. But we also see an actual physical kingdom that is referred to throughout the scriptures. Throughout the Old and New Testament, the promise was made that Messiah would set up an earthly kingdom and he would rule physically over the nations. This is the specific promise that believers in the first century were anticipating with great eagerness. In fact, the hope of this physical kingdom was used as a way to describe true believers. In Matthew chapter 26, Joseph of Arimathea is described as one who was waiting for the kingdom of God. In other words, he was waiting for the physical kingdom to come. That was the hope of every true believer. God clearly promised that one day he would establish a physical kingdom on earth. 
He would establish specific land borders of the nation of Israel as He promised in the book of Genesis. He would establish Messiah as King and He would rule over all the nations with Jerusalem being the capital. This was the hope of the Old Testament believers waiting for the kingdom of God, waiting for the physical kingdom to come. It was a hope for what was coming in the future and that hope provided them power and assurance to live in the present. So then when we come to studying the scripture and we come across a reference to the kingdom of God, we must look at the context to know if it's referring to the physical kingdom or the spiritual kingdom or some combination of both. And here when the disciples ask, is now the time for the restoration? They are asking, was now the time for Jesus to set up his physical kingdom? It's clear because they refer to the restored kingdom of Israel. That is referring very specifically to the physical kingdom of God. They knew he was the Messiah. They knew that he had promised to restore the kingdom at some point throughout the scriptures. And they figured now must be the time they had been waiting for. The wording of their question tells us they believed now was the time. They knew Jesus had already ushered in the spiritual kingdom of God. He did that through his death and resurrection for all who believed. In fact, Jesus said himself during his ministry that the kingdom of God was here. And so they just assumed that now was the time for the physical kingdom. And they were ready and they wanted to know, is now the day for the messianic kingdom? Verse 7. And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. Notice, Jesus doesn't really rebuke his disciples because it was a natural question for them to ask. He answers them, well, the kingdom's not going to be physically restored just yet. That day will come in the future, but you can't know when that time is going to be. And that phrase, times or epochs, is an all-inclusive phrase. It means you can't know the specific date. You can't even know the general period in which God is going to restore the kingdom. You can't know the day. You can't know the hour. You can't know the week, the month, the year, or even the time of the season of the year. God has his own timetable, and we are not privy to his timing. We can't know his plan for the ages outside of what is revealed in his word, and he has chosen not to tell us specifically when he will restore the kingdom. Jesus repeats here what he said earlier in Matthew chapter 24. He was referring to the restoration of the kingdom. In Matthew 24, 36, he says this, But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. The Father alone has a fixed timetable for all of human history. We don't know the future, but he does, thankfully. God is in control of history. And just because he doesn't share his exact timetable with us doesn't mean that he doesn't know exactly what he is doing and he has a very precise timetable that he is working all things towards. We don't have to worry about if the kingdom will be restored, for it will happen and in his timing and in his perfect way. And Jesus basically responds to the disciples' questions by telling them, you just need to wait. You can't know when it's going to happen. So instead, you wait upon the Lord. The kingdom will come, but we can't know when that will happen. And so we are called upon to wait patiently for the coming king and the establishment of his kingdom. In fact, throughout the book of Acts, we see that the concept of the kingdom of God is repeated. It begins talking about the kingdom of God here at the beginning of the book. And then the last verse in Acts 28, 31, we read that Paul was preaching about the kingdom of God. And so the book begins and ends with the kingdom of God. Jesus said we couldn't know when the physical kingdom of God would be restored. Then the disciples went on to preach that the kingdom of God was here. The key to understanding how the kingdom is not yet here and yet it still is here is to understand the difference between the physical and the spiritual kingdoms. The Messiah's reign is currently a spiritual reign through the hearts and minds of all believers. But there will come a day when his physical kingdom will in fact be a reality. God's kingdom has come, as Jesus said in Luke chapter 10, but it is currently a spiritual kingdom in the hearts of his disciples. But that does not mean that the physical nature has been abandoned or overlooked or rejected. It will begin at some point in the future. But now Christ only rules in the hearts of men through the church. That's what the apostles were teaching as they taught about the kingdom of God. We see this throughout the New Testament. Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 13. For he delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And so we see Paul refers to the kingdom of his son, the kingdom of Messiah as the realm of salvation into which every believer is spiritually transferred at the moment we come to faith in him. The Messiah currently reigns in our hearts. 
Romans 14, chapter 7. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Paul reminds us that currently the kingdom of God is a spiritual sense. There will come a day when it is a physical reality, but now it is of a spiritual nature. Jesus even said this as he stood before Pilate in John 18, 36. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Jesus' kingdom presently is not of this world. He currently sits in heaven and He reigns from the right hand of the Father through the work of the Spirit in His disciples. But a day will come when He will also reign physically upon the earth. The King is not now seen, but there will come a day when all will see Him. See, the disciples knew that the physical kingdom would come and they just wanted to know when it was going to happen. They thought Jesus would start His physical rule immediately upon His resurrection. And yet the answer they are given is not, you got it wrong, there will be no physical kingdom. That's not what Jesus says. He says, you just can't know when it's going to be established. And they were to wait for the physical kingdom that would one day come. For now the kingdom would be spiritual in nature, but the physical will in fact take place. And we know that is a truth presented throughout the scripture. The day will come when Messiah will return to earth and he will reign. We refer to that day as the millennial kingdom. Millennial means a thousand. In the book of Revelation, we are told that it will, his reign will last for a thousand years before the new heavens and the new earth are created. And during those thousand years, all the prophecies of the scripture of a literal kingdom of God on earth, a Messiah reigning over Israel, will be fulfilled. At that time, the kingdom of Israel will be restored. It is guaranteed. God is not yet ruling in that sense, but he will rule that way in the future. And so here the disciples learn that there would be a gap of time between the spiritual kingdom that's established and the physical kingdom to come. And during this gap in time, they were to wait for the king to come back. 2,000 years later, we are still living in this gap of time, waiting for the coming kingdom. And as we wait, we are to remind ourselves continually of what it is that we are waiting for. And as long as we remember that we are waiting for the coming of his kingdom, it brings us hope. It brings us hope because we realize that one day this planet will change. One day this existence will get better. One day evil will be vanquished because God is in control and he has a plan and he will physically reign one day over all the earth. He's returning and knowing that and believing that gives us a hope of a better tomorrow. We need to be waiting, looking forward to the restoration of the kingdom. The reality is our hope as New Testament believers is to be the same as that of the Old Testament saint, the hope of the restoration of the kingdom. Now, we cannot know the timing of his return, the time of the restoration of the kingdom. He makes it very clear it's impossible to know that. Jesus made it very clear. No human being can know the time of his return. Despite what any teacher on TV or book or anyone else might proclaim throughout the years, we can't know the timing. He's made that very clear. In fact, we're not even supposed to try to figure out the time. Rather, we're to live with the assurance that he will bring it about in his timing. And our hope is not in political rulers or kingdoms of this age. Our hope is the kingdom yet to come. And so as believers in Jesus, as his disciples, we wait with confidence knowing the kingdom is coming. And knowing that is what gives us the hope and the strength to endure the temporary hardships of this life. For we know that a better day is coming when the kingdom will be established. We see not only are we to wait for the king, but next we see that we are called to witness for the king. Look at verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. This verse starts with a word of contrast. But Jesus says in verse 7, you can't know when the physical kingdom will be restored. But here is what you can know. You can know what your role will be in the current spiritual kingdom. You can't know when the physical kingdom will begin, but here is what you can know. You can know that you will receive the Holy Spirit, you will receive power, and you will be my witnesses. And so we see as his disciples, we are witnesses for the king. Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit coming upon you as a future event here. This is referring to what would happen to the disciples on the day of Pentecost. They had to wait until Pentecost for the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit to come upon them. Had to wait for Jesus to leave before the Spirit could be sent. But since that time, this has happened for every believer at the moment we first come to faith in Him. 
If you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ, then you have already received the Holy Spirit. That means you already have the power that is promised to come in this verse. The Greek word for power here is dunamis. It means power or strength. It's the ability to perform mighty deeds. It's where we get the English word dynamite from. It refers to having the power of God within us, that which enables us to do all that He commands and all that He desires. The Greek word for witness is martus. It means witness. It means one who testifies to what they've seen. It describes one who is willing to die because of that witness. Uh, we get the word martyr from this word. The word was used to describe those who shared what they know to be true. It was also used to describe those who died for their faith, the martyrs who died for Jesus Christ. A witness is one who tells what they've seen and who does not recant. A witness is one who may even die because they're giving testimony to those facts. And Jesus says all believers will be his witnesses. And notice, no one is left out. He doesn't say, well, some of you might be my witnesses, or you might be my witnesses if you try really hard. He says, you will be my witnesses. Every believer is a witness. That is who we are by the power of the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. We don't have to choose to be a witness. It is who we already are. It is what we are every moment of every day. We witness what we believe about God every moment by our words and our actions and our thoughts. It's not a question of if we will be a witness. The question is, how effective is our witness to others? Jesus declares that the current kingdom he's established is a spiritual one. For in his kingdom, most believers are not in positions of great authority or influence. Rather, his followers are simply commissioned to be witnesses. We are those who testify to the world who Jesus is and what he has done. We are those who are filled with the Holy Spirit, who have his power within us to testify to the truth. When we read this, we should ask ourselves a question of what type of witness am I being for my king? Each of us is already telling others what we believe by how we live our lives. Reality is our actions often speak louder than our words do. And we are all his witnesses if we are a believer. The question is, what type of a witness are we being? Those early Christians understood what it meant to be a witness. Many of them became martyrs. They died because of their faith. Many of them sealed their witness to Christ by their blood and have throughout the ages. It was their willingness to die for what they knew to be true that God used to grow the church. Because as unbelievers saw the way those martyrs died so bravely, they wanted to know the God the Christians knew. They wanted to know the God who would give people such power in the face of such horrible adversity. Those believers' lives and even their deaths testified accurately to who Jesus was. They were clearly effective witnesses by the power of the Spirit who dwelled within them. But we should ask ourselves, what about us? How effective is our witness? Would anyone want to put their faith in Jesus, want a relationship with Him by what they see in our lives? Would they want what we have? See, the reality is we have the same indwelling presence and power of the Holy Spirit that the apostles had, that the early believers had. But are we letting His power flow through us or not? We are witnesses for the King. We tell others who He is, what He is like by our words and our actions. And Jesus here specifically declares not only that we as his disciples are his witnesses, but he says where we would be his witnesses at. Like he says, in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. Now, as he spoke these words, they were in Jerusalem. That was a city they were located in. It was the social, the political, the religious center of the nation of Israel. It's the immediate area they were at when he spoke these words. Judea was the area of all of southern Israel. You might compare it to a county in our day. Samaria was the neighboring county. It was just north, but it wasn't just the next county over. It was where the enemies of the Jews lived. Jews and Samaritans did not get along. They were bitter enemies. They had strong political and religious differences. Samaritans despised the Jews. Jews despised the Samaritans. And Jesus says, you're going to be my witnesses in enemy territory. And then he says, you're going to be my witnesses to the remotest parts of the earth. In other words, to the ends of the earth. Jesus says, you're going to be my witnesses over the entire globe. You're not just going to stay in Israel. You're not just going to stay in Samaria. The message I have for you will be carried to all people. 
Now this is rather revolutionary teaching because earlier in his ministry, Jesus said very particular he had only come for the house of Israel. And now he declares that he's going to send his disciples to go out where he did not go himself, out to the ends of the earth. Now there would no longer be any racial distinctions in the people of God. God was calling all men of all tribes to join his kingdom. He was sending his disciples to preach the gospel, to be his witnesses in all the earth. Today, we are filled with the same power of the Holy Spirit. We are still his witnesses. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you have been indwelt and baptized by the Holy Spirit. You have the dynamite power of the Almighty God dwelling within you this very day. You are a witness of what you know to be true about who Jesus is. You are a witness of all that you know and have read in the Scripture. The question is, what type of witness are you being? Are you accurately portraying the King to others, or are you distorting His image? See, a witness doesn't need all the answers on every topic that comes up. A witness simply testifies to what they've seen and what they've experienced. A witness doesn't need to try to convince others of what is true or what they're saying. A witness simply testifies to what they know is true. And that's what we are called upon to do as believers in Jesus. We don't have to go out and try to convince others of anything. But we do need to tell them who Jesus is by our words and by our actions. And we need to be accurate witnesses. These were the last words of our Lord to his disciples. His last words on earth to us. And more than anything, he wanted to remind his disciples that they were witnesses. He wanted to remind us that we have the power to fulfill the task that he has given us by the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. And we are living testimonies every day to who Jesus is and what he has done. Now, oftentimes, this verse in particular is used to motivate people to get out and witness to others, to share the gospel specifically. We use this verse as a, a witnessing uh, motivator, and we refer to that as something you go do for a specific period of time. We talk about how we went out and witnessed to a person, by which we mean we shared the gospel with them. And that's certainly important. We are called to go and share the message with people, to teach the gospel message to those who are lost. But we must realize something, that witnessing is more than just words, and it's not just a single event you do one time when you take someone through the particulars of the gospel. Witnessing is who we are. It's what we do every moment of every day because we belong to Jesus Christ and we are His witnesses. We are His witnesses at all times and all circumstances. We don't become a witness some days and other days we're not. We are His witnesses at all times. We are the only representation of Jesus Christ that unbelievers will ever see before their eyes. And that's why it is so crucial that we live our lives in a way that is accurately reflecting who He is. The way we speak to others, the way we respond when someone mistreats us, what we laugh at, the type of jokes that we tell to others, it is all a witness of Jesus Christ. What we participate in, where we spend our time, how we entertain ourselves, what we post on Facebook. It is all a witness to the world of who Jesus Christ is. And so we need to ask ourselves, what type of witness have you been even this past week? What have others seen in you by the way that you have conducted your life? Are you being an effective witness of Jesus Christ? If you are, then that is great. Keep it up. But if you have been a bad witness, if there's something that you're participating in that is distorting his image to others, then it's time to repent and change what you are doing because we are his witnesses and we must seek to be good witnesses for the king. So come to verse 9, we are reminded of our third principle. And that is we are also to work for the king. Look at verse 9. And after he'd said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on and a cloud received him out of their sight. Jesus' final words recorded were spoken in verse 8. After he reminded his disciples that they were his witnesses, he was lifted up into heaven and a cloud surrounded him. Can you imagine what that must have been like for the disciples who were standing there? One minute they're thinking, time for the kingdom has come. Are you going to do your kingdom right now? Is this it? And the next, Jesus just starts floating up and boom, he's gone into the sky. It must have been an incredible sight to behold. A powerful way of answering their question. Jesus says, you can't know when the kingdom is going to be restored and it's not now because I'm leaving. Verse 10, and as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. 
The men were so amazed at what just happened, they just stood there staring in the sky. You can almost imagine their mouths just hanging open as they just kept staring up above, staring intently. Apparently, they could not begin to comprehend what had just taken place. Jesus said, now is not the time of my physical kingdom. You are my witnesses, and you're going to be my witnesses all around the globe. And then he goes up into the sky. And the disciples were left trying to grapple with the significance of what just happened. Maybe they thought he would come right back down. Maybe they thought it was only temporary. Uh, they were clearly confused. Then as they were staring, two men appeared in white clothing. That description of two men in white clothing is clearly a reference to angels. Luke chapter 24, Acts chapter 10, both use the same descriptions to refer to angels. A way of describing that they were in bright, shining clothes. Obvious, they were not ordinary men. They were angels with a message. And this was their message, verse 11. They also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. Basically, the angels say, pick up your mouths and get back to work. Stop staring up above. Get busy about the job that Jesus gave you to do. Be effective witnesses. Stop staring because the king will return one day. For now, get back to work. Jesus will come again just as you saw him leave. But because you don't know when he's going to come back, because you don't know when he's going to restore the kingdom, you're to get back to work. Now, there's an emphasis in the word that's used here that is actually missed in the New American Standard Version. The word is uranus. It means sky or heaven, the abode of God. Context tells us if the word is referring to the sky, the atmosphere, or it's referring to heaven in the sense of the abode of God. Now, the New American Standard translates Uranus twice here as sky and twice as heaven. But when the same Greek word is used so often in such close proximity, it's best to translate it with the same word in English. Sadly, the New American Standard doesn't do that. It uses sky and heaven for the same Greek word. If you have a New King James, it has a better translation because they use heaven throughout. Verse 10, they look steadfastly toward heaven. Verse 11, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in a like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Whenever a word is repeated, it is the author's way of emphasizing a truth or a principle. And Luke uses the same word, heaven, four times here to emphasize the reality Jesus is in heaven. It's not just that he floated up into the sky and kind of disappeared into the atmosphere. He went to heaven. He's no longer physically on the earth. He left the earth and is now in heaven. And that's why the word is repeated, to make it crystal clear for us. He's in heaven this very moment, and there is to be no confusion on that. Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father, ruling his spiritual kingdom through the hearts of believers. And the angels here make a promise. They say Jesus will return one day in the same way that you've seen him go. Meaning one day he would physically return in a cloud to the Mount of Olives. He would do it in a very visible manner for all to see, just as he did when he left. The king will return. And so we, his people, are to get to work as we wait. We're to be about the work of his kingdom. That's what the disciples did. They left the Mount of Olives on this day, and they went out, and they were his witnesses all around the globe because they understood the motivation behind all we do is this promise that the king is returning. Knowing he is returning should be a motivator to us to get out and do his work. For when the king returns... We don't want to be found sleeping on the job. We want to be ready to hear that he is pleased with all that we have done. Jesus says this in Revelation 22:12, 12. Behold, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. Jesus is coming back and we don't know when, but we're to be about his work. For when the king returns, he will judge our works. And as believers, those who love him, we want to please him. That should be the natural inclination of our hearts. And so our motive for working for his glory is that he might be pleased upon his return. We have a job to do as believers. We are to be sharing the gospel with others. We are to be living our lives as effective witnesses for the king. We can't just sit around staring into the sky doing nothing. We need to get to work because the king is coming again. And each of us will be forced to give an account on that day. The reality is many of us tend to procrastinate on things. Oftentimes, we'll put off today what we can start to do tomorrow. All of us procrastinate, some of us perhaps more than others. 
But for example, if I told you that I wanted you to read a book and be prepared to speak on it on December 14th, 2020, many of you would wait until at least 2020 to begin to look at the book. Some of you would probably wait till December of 2020, and some of you might even wait till December 13th of 2020 before you read the book and prepared to speak. We all prioritize things by deadlines. If something won't happen for years, usually not a big concern for most of us. But if I were to tell you that I wanted you to read this book, and any time starting tomorrow, I was gonna call you up in front of the church and ask you to share a report on what you've read, well, that might change the way you approached it a little bit. Then you would be a little more careful because you know you could be called upon at any moment to give a report for what you have read. You might start reading the book this very afternoon to be prepared. You might even look at your notes every day before you came to church, not knowing if this was going to be the day you were going to be called up front to talk. There's a difference in response if we know the deadline or not. I think that's the reason why Jesus did not tell us when he would be returning. That's why he didn't tell his disciples when the kingdom would be restored. Because if he had told them, you know what, it's not going to be for at least another 2,000 years, that would have impacted the way they and future generations live their lives. Because they would have tended to procrastinate in their responsibilities. Because if you know for certain Jesus isn't coming back for another 1,000 years, well, that changes the impetus for how you will live this next moment. But that's not what God tells us. Instead, the angels say he's coming back, and it could be any day. And so we need to be about the work ready for his return because he could come back at any moment. The king is, in fact, returning. But that's only good news for those who belong to him. When Jesus returns, he will destroy his evildoers and unbelievers. He will establish his physical kingdom for his people only. And if you are here this morning and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, then knowing that He is returning should be frightening to you. Because upon His return, all those who don't know them know Him will be judged for their sins. And only those who know Him as Savior will inherit the physical kingdom. And if you would like to speak to someone how you can know Jesus and be welcomed into His spiritual kingdom now and be sure to place in the physical kingdom yet to come, then please see me after the service. For those of us who know Jesus, we are already members of his spiritual kingdom. And so we have a responsibility as those who belong to him to continue to be his witnesses. We need to be waiting for the king to come. We have the hope and the assurance that his coming will, in fact, take place. We need to realize that we are witnesses for the king. We need to ensure that we are good witnesses, accurately reflecting his nature. And we need to be working for the king, not just staring into the sky, but doing all that he has called us to do, knowing that he is returning. We have the hope of our king returning, and knowing that drastically changes everything. Let this truth be the focus of your thoughts in the week ahead. Just as he left, he is coming again, and what a glorious day that will be. We have the assurance of his return in the future, and knowing that he is coming in the future gives us power in the present. So let us live for him, knowing that he is, in fact, coming again. Let's pray.